Alrighty folks, and welcome to the Conacher Podcast channel. This is episode 40, the Western Teen Dynasty. So last week we did talk about how the Teen Dynasty managed to get to power with the likes of Sima Yi, and how he managed to use the same tricks that Tao Tao did when he was usurping power from the Han. And it worked like a charm for Sima Yi and his family, and then of course his descendants later on formed the Jin Dynasty. Now there's one thing that differentiates the Jin Dynasty away from previous dynasties thus far. And what they did is they conducted politics in a different way from their predecessors, like the Han and Wei. Which is important because it shows how the Western Jin Dynasty actually fell apart as well. So Emperor Wu of Jin, seeing how the Sima clan got to power, and in essence, how the Tao clan got to power when they overthrew the Han. When it came to imperial family members, sitting emperors would often move potential rivals to posts away from the capital, basically keeping them out of sight and out of the way from any real power. Now that's all fine and well in terms of removing potential rivals within the family, but if an emperor dies suddenly, with no adult heir, outsiders can then muscle in. And this is how Tao cl- the Tao clan usurped power from the Han, and in turn, the Sima clan did the same thing to the Tao family. All of a sudden, there's a powerful regent, he's an outsider to the family, and then before you know it, the dynasty's been overthrown. Recognising a need to try something different, or to make a change, Emperor Wu decided to not expel family members, but to actually give them real positions of power with real authority. Moreover, all of them could stay inside Luoyang, the imperial capital, if they chose to. The idea was that if there was a time when an emperor died who left a young child as crown prince, power would still be within the family, therefore a civil war would be avoided. (laughs) Yeah, because families won't kill each other for power, right? Despite not recognising that brothers would slit each other's throats for something as simple as a promotion within government, Emperor Wu gave his nine sons princedoms, each having equal power with one another. And going by Confucian traditions, the eldest son was chosen as the heir, and all seemed well. Except it wasn't, which I will get to later. Anyway, the reign of Emperor Wu was rather impressive. He managed to keep the peace between the former three kingdoms, and he managed to get the economy up and running again. It seemed like all was well in order with political stability, peace and economic prosperity. The one issue, however, was not with Emperor Wu, but with his current prince, Sima Zhong. For all to see, it was pretty obvious that Sima Zhong was so incompetent, And not in the usual way where he would spend all of his time with women and hunting, but it was because he was actually really stupid. Some scholars in the modern day have gone as far to say that he actually had a learning disability, but of course that can't be proven. What didn't help was that Emperor Wu married his eldest son to a woman named Jia Nanfeng. Her family had helped the Sima family get to power in the first place, so it seemed right to give their eligible daughter a seat alongside the future emperor. The future empress Jia turned out to be more ambitious than anyone realised, and played a crucial role in the collapse of the Jin dynasty. For example, to ensure she kept her seat as future empress, she sent a worrying Emperor Wu letters under her husband's name, which reassured the aging emperor that he did make the right choice in choosing Sima Zhong. Unfortunately for everyone involved at the time, Emperor Wu popped his clogs and died in the year 290. With his death, everything he had built began to fall apart. Straight away, the court politics began to spiral out of control, and the two regents to help the emperor began scheming against each other, to which Empress Jia took advantage of. But basically, what was happening was that the two regents, like like I said, they were scheming against each other. One of them was one of the crown princes, as in like one of the sons of the dead emperor, and another one was a man who helped the emperor get to power. 
And basically what happened was this powerful minister who was an outsider was trying to muscle his way to influence the emperor more and the other crown prince just tried to avoid all of the conflict basically. And then what ended up happening was Empress Jia and this scheming outsider to the family managed to kill said crown prince. So that's one down out of nine. And then what happened was that Empress Jia would then use this killing as a way of saying that the other minister, the guy who was outside the family, treasonous. And then, of course, he then got killed. Now, this is what Empress Jia did best. She was very good at using people, and then once they had outlived their usefulness, she would find a way to kill them. And this is what kept on happening, and it happened with at least three of the brothers. And then, of course, after she's dead, there's a civil war. But we'll get to that later on anyway. Now, rather than confusing you with a bunch of names and a who stabbed who in the back kind of vibe, let's just say that the whole Sima clan was tearing itself to pieces, whilst Empress Jia was carving a way through to power through her husband, who was now called Emperor Hui. To give you an idea of how incompetent this guy was, there is a story where a minister once told him in the court that one of the provinces was running out of rice, or it already had run out of rice, to which the emperor responded, they don't have rice, why don't they eat meat then? So it just goes to show the level of incompetence at the highest tier of the government structure at this stage. So it's safe to say, based on this little story, that Emperor Hui was not the guy running the country or in charge, but it was his wife, Empress Jia. Empress Jia did eventually get her comeuppance. What happened was she overstepped the mark when Emperor Hui had a son with another concubine, and rumours were circulating around about her not giving birth to any child, saying that she was sterile, etc. So you already know where this is going to go, right? So Empress Jia was worried about this new threat, who was called Sima Yu. Sima Yu was an intelligent young man who had a good, bright future ahead of him. If he was born into another family, that is. Being, being intelligent and competent painted a huge target on his back. And of course, the one holding the crossbow, ready to take a shot at him, was Empress Jia. One evening, she invited the future emperor to see his father. But when he arrived, a maid came out and said that the emperor was too busy. But whilst the young prince waited, he was told to drink three litre jugs of wine. Now, I don't know about you, but drinking Baijiu, and you're drinking, like, a litre of it, you're going to be smashed. So drinking three of them, you will be paralysed, basically. Now, of course, this was an impossible task, and, you know, everyone in the room knew it. And Sima Yu did say that it was impossible to drink all of that wine, to which the maid replied that it would be a breach of Confucian values to refuse the wine, considering that it was from the emperor himself. And, of course, it was from his father. So with no other choice, Sima Yu forced himself to drink the wine and obviously got hammered in the process. And, of course, it was at this time that Empress Dowager Jia arrived and made Sima Yu write a letter to his father. The young prince was so drunk that he didn't even know what he was writing, and it turned out to be his death sentence. The letter stated that Sima Yu was going to rebel against his father and take over the throne, which sounds silly to me considering he was already crown prince. So, I mean, all he had to do was wait for his dad to die and then he could take over. But, nevertheless, Empress Jia showed this confession to her husband and accused her son-in-law of treason. Now, I did read somewhere that uh, Empress Jia actually did... Um, forged the letter herself a little bit as well, just because Sima Yu was so hammered and so drunk that when he was writing this letter, of course, there's going to be sections of the characters that were missing, or, you know, the character was just outright wrong in the first place. So then, of course, when she gets this letter and, like, you know, he's passed out drunk at this stage, that's when she filled in the blank, so to speak. And you know, she probably did manage to copy his handwriting as well, and then 
add some flair to the letter, which then made it even worse for this current prince. And yeah, this is when things really start to spiral out of control for everyone. Not willing to kill his own son, Emperor Hui demoted him to the status of commoner. With this act, Empress Jia had turned too many people against her now, and it was the current regent, Sima Lun, who gave her advice, saying that her son-in-law was still a threat and therefore she should kill him. Empress Jia took the advice and had the prince assassinated. She thought all was well until Sima Lun used this murder against her and from there she was forced to commit suicide when she was imprisoned. Sima Lun then declared himself emperor and arrested Emperor Hui and as a result all of the other princes were furious and started fighting each other for the crown. Before anyone could say, who's emperor now? The remaining brothers began raising armies, then clashing with each other for the ultimate goal, the throne. They were ripping each other to pieces and in essence, they were ripping China to pieces as well. Now, the problem a lot of them did face was that China had only just begun recovering from the bloody civil war that was the Three Kingdoms period. So when it came to the size of the armies and recruitment, the princes had to rely on the nomadic tribes to the north and the west. These tribes were known as the Wuhu or the Five Barbarians. As part of the deal for these tribes for military service, they were allowed to settle in China. It was hoped then that the tribes could be assimilated into Chinese culture and it was dealing with external threats whilst they were trying to solve their internal problems. So it was like two birds with one stone almost. Now the result was, of course, a massive migration eastward where these nomads would move into China proper and they began taking over the land. Due to the tribes being treated like dirt, they inevitably rebelled against their gene masters and in the year 311, a powerful Wuhu general named Liliyan took his army to Liliyan and sacked it. According to historical sources, more than 300,000 people were killed in the bloodbath that ensued when the capital fell. Afterwards, the Jin court fled to the south, where they re-established themselves whilst northern China began to rip itself to pieces. The fall of the Western Jin and the sacking of Luoyang would end the time of peace to another time of chaos in China, which was called the Sixteen Dynasties as well as the Northern and Southern Dynasties. And that, my friends, is where we will continue our narrative next week. Now I do realise this is a short episode, but of course the Jin Dynasty itself was extremely short in this sense, so of course the episode has to be short as well. Now I hope you have enjoyed this episode, and until next time, I look forward to hearing from you on the Chronicle Podcast channel. Thanks for listening.